Hi friends, I'm Jess. Welcome to my sewing channel, Redhead Threads. Today I'm going to show you how I made a Cinderella transformation dress. Let's go. I'm Jess. Welcome to my first episode of Redhead Threads. This is an extension of my business, The Hazel Shope, which I will link down below. And I'm going to be sharing a lot of different things on my channel. A lot of it's going to be costume related or just big sewing projects that I'm working on at the time. But today I wanted to jump in to my first video. And this is a big one that I'm going to be sharing with you. Most of my videos I don't think will be this long, but this one is actually going to be a two-parter. So I am the head costume designer at Kavad Academy of the Arts in New Holland, Pennsylvania, and we recently put on uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. This was the 2013 Broadway revival version, so a lot of Cinderella's costume changes happened right on stage. This was a big challenge for me as a costume designer, and this honestly, a Cinderella transformation dress has been on my sewist bucket list for a while now. So when I found out that we were doing the show, I jumped at the chance to design costumes for it. I feel like I should clarify, this is by no means a how-to video. I'm not showing you how you should make a Cinderella transformation dress. I'm just showing you what my process was like. And you'll see throughout the videos that there were quite a few changes that had to be made to my original design as I went along because it's theater, and theater presents some really interesting challenges. When I started working on the designs for this production of Cinderella, I knew that I wanted to ground the costumes in a specific time period. When I see a lot of fantasy costuming, particularly I noticed this in Into the Woods, um, they tend to mix up styles all the way back from medieval ages to the mid-1800s. So I wanted to really ground these costumes in the 1770s, 1780s period, um, when you think of the French court scene and grand balls that were happening. So the costumes were not quite period accurate because I didn't have the time or the budget or it wasn't going to allow for the movement in the show to do all of the padding and corsetry involved in those kind of costumes, but they were definitely inspired by that time period, so you'll see that as we go along. There was a lot of research involved in putting together this show, so in addition to researching the time period for the costumes, I also did a lot of research on how to build a Cinderella transformation dress, and actually that research was part of the inspiration for putting together this video, because what I found when I was doing research, there are a lot of YouTube videos of Cinderella transformation dresses, but a lot of what you see are just the finished product. This is me transforming in the dress, this is me spinning and the dress dropping, but they don't get into the nitty gritty of how it actually physically, mechanically is put together. And so even though this is not a how-to video, I'm hoping that it will help other people who are in the same research conundrum that I was in, trying to figure out how do all the pieces fit how does the costume change, the quick change behind the scenes actually work? You're going to see some of that footage as well in the second video where I actually show you how we get Cinderella in and out of her costume so quickly between scenes um, and why I made some of the decisions that I did that were unique to our particular situation. Um, so yeah, I hope that this video is helpful and inspirational and just fun to watch. I started off by making Cinderella's peasant dress. This part had to be done first because I started working on the dress 10.30 at night on a Saturday and I needed that part of the dress done for Sunday because we were going to be doing a little film shoot with a couple of the members of the cast, Cinderella, Prince Topher, and the two stepsisters as a promotional for our production of Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. However, I procrastinate. I put things off to the last minute. I do my best work under pressure, to be fair. I meet my deadlines and things get done and they get done pretty well. But this was one where I was kind of pushing it. I'm not proud about that. Um, so what you're gonna see in the first part of this video is me starting the peasant dress. I found two circular tablecloths 
from a thrift store. There's a brown one and a green one. And I cut out a semicircle in the middle for a place in the waist. I cut a little slit there as well. And then I sewed them both together and create a waistband for it, which you're going to see in the first part of this video. To determine the size of the semicircle, I took the waist measurement from our actress, divided by 3.14 and then by 2 to get the radius. Good morning, everybody. It is the next morning, and I went to bed at midnight last night. Unfortunately, you didn't get to see the work that I did on the skirt in between my introduction and when I actually started sewing because my camera battery died. Uh, still getting used to how long the battery lasts on this thing. So I want to show you what I accomplished last night. Um, I was not able to get the whole peasant dress done for the photo shoot this morning. So I've decided I'm gonna take the skirt over to the theater. We're gonna throw a peasant top on Cinderella and call it good. Uh, because what I realized at midnight last night is that I have the wrong size pattern. Um, this is the, can you see it? Six to 14 size um, for simplicity 8161. And I need a 22 because our girl is a 20 um, in pattern sizes and the peasant top, the, the bodice for the peasant dress has to go over top of her ball gown. So we need even a little more room. Um, and considering that the theater is a 20 minute drive away, I was not going out at midnight <laughs> to get the pattern. Um, and I didn't have the brain power to, to grade the pattern from a 14 up to a 22 at midnight. So that part will get done later and you will be seeing that very soon. Cinderella's ball gown is going to get tucked up inside of the green skirt. Now, I haven't figured out just yet how I want to attach it, um, but I'm going to figure that out as I go. I added patches to the brown skirt and decided to leave the hem as it is. I thought about making it ratty at first, but I figured this is just easier and it'll hold up better. The green skirt is just going to get tucked up into the waistband for now, which I made using some fabric scraps from my own stash. A velcro closure in the back holds it all together. I'm just working on surging all of the pieces for Cinderella's bodice. I use my um, my Janome Harmony overlock machine to surge the edges and it just gives it a nice clean finish. It also helps from um, fraying and from just, it, it helps the garment last longer if you can finish the edges somehow. Some people like to use pinking shears or you can do a sort of a pseudo overlock stitch on your regular machine as well um, or you can fold the edges the raw edge over and fell it um, I've seen that done too if you want to hand stitch it all right so it's the next day I've just finished up the surging on the bodice pieces for Cinderella's costume. I think what I'm going to do is cut out a second set of pieces to make a lining for the bodice except for the sleeves. I hadn't originally wanted to do that because of the bulk that it would create, but I think it's really going to help to make that outer garment sturdy so that when she rips it off, it actually does come off and doesn't just get all tangled up. So I'm gonna give that a go. Thank you. 
So for the interfacing, I'm using Pillon 911FF Fusible Featherweight Interfacing. It's got a good bit of thickness to it, so it should give the, the lining of the bodice some good structure. Um, this one is, like I said, it's fusible, so if you look real close, you can see that the one side sort of has these dots on it, and that's the glue. That's the side that's going to go onto the fabric, and then the other side is smooth. So when it comes time to iron it, just make sure that you're putting the right side on the fabric or you're going to end up with the adhesive all over your iron. So as I'm working with my interfacing, I'm going to make sure that the side with the dots on it is facing down towards the fabric, that the smooth side is on top. It doesn't line up perfectly, but that's okay because once these pieces are together, I'm going to serge them and that will clean up the edge and get it nice and even for, for sewing the pieces together. I'm going to take my wet towel. It's not sopping wet, just pretty damp. Um, you're going to be holding your iron on here for about 10 seconds in each spot, so you want it to be pretty damp. That way it doesn't leave any scorch marks on your towel. And when you're ironing the interfacing, you want to make sure that you're not wiggling the iron or running it over the piece like you sometimes would when you're ironing a piece of clothing because that will move the interfacing and get it out of position. So you want to just press and lift as you go. And you'll see that the towel is also creating a lot of steam that's going to help bind the interfacing to the fabric. I learned about a year ago the hard way that even if you have an iron that you can put water into it and steam from it, don't do it. Just get yourself a good quality iron and a little spit bottle at the dollar store because no matter how much you try to get all the water out of your iron every time that you're finished with it, even if you try and empty it, you're never going to get all of it out and you're going to end up getting rust inside of your iron. And all of those hacks of how to clean your iron, use vinegar, use baking soda, doesn't work. It's just going to make the problem worse. Because vinegar eventually will corrode metal. Using deionized water also can corrode the metal. He should be good now. Feels a little bit better, but there's still a couple of spots that are not binding properly. So sometimes as a last resort, I'll flip it over so that the fabric side is up, and I'll iron this side just to get it really, really hot. You do have to be careful though that if you have, like I do, any interfacing sticking out around the edges, that you don't iron over that, because at this point the adhesive is facing up. And like I said, you'll end up with glue adhesive melted all over your iron if you accidentally catch those edges. You'll know that you've finished fusing your interfacing to the fabric when it doesn't peel up around the edges. The fabric is now a lot sturdier and it's finally ready to be sewn. to press the seams that I've just sewn for the bodice. I'm going to work on the outer bodice first and then I'm going to get to the lining. Um, when I'm working on the lining, 
I'm going to not press from the inside like I would normally do. I'd normally press and lay open the inside of the seam and then flip it over and press the other side. Interfacing tends to, to melt and tear apart and stick to your iron if the iron's too hot. So I'm just gonna carefully sort of lay that open and iron from the other side. One piece of equipment that I found is really helpful when working with curved seams like you'll find on a bodice, especially around the bust area, is something called a tailoring ham. Um, I picked this one up at Joann's. You can find them at most sewing stores where notions are sold. And it's just sort of a padded form. A lot of them have sawdust in them that you can use to, to lay your seam over top of it and just to give you a curved surface instead of working on a flat ironing board. Um, because sometimes it's hard to, to kind of get in those corners and those curves if you don't have a, a rounded surface to work on. I'm definitely glad that I went back and added a lining with interfacing. This is feeling really sturdy and stable and I think it's going to add a lot of great structure to the bodice. I really didn't want to add the boning as was recommended with the original pattern because costumes need to fit so many different actors and if we want to use this costume again or rent it out, putting boning right along the seams makes that nearly impossible to do or at least very inconvenient. Um, so I think adding structure in other ways is going to help deal with that problem and prevent future problems. So what I'm going to do is finish the outside of the bodice, add the sleeves onto it. I'm not doing a lining for the sleeves because like I said earlier, that's just going to add more bulk. Um, but then I'm going to add the lining to it. I decided I'm not going to attach the lining to the sleeve hole. I'm just going to leave it open like you see in coats sometimes. Um, I think that's going to be the easiest way to do it. I might go and tack it down by hand later, um, but then I'll just bag out the lining and I'll show you that part when I get to it. I'm sure I'll mention this many more times to come on my channel, but I hate, hate, hate setting in sleeves. It is the bane of my existence, but I have to admit that's partially my problem because I'm also really bad, meaning I never do, I never set or transfer my pattern markings, so I never have the mark for where the sleeve goes, and I guess it's my own fault, but I hate setting in sleeves. So I just put the bodice on my dress form to to check and see if it was going to cover the top of the skirt because I think anyways I'm going to add like a flounce or some trim along the bottom just because there has to be another dress under this anyways and I really want to make sure she's covered and she doesn't have any of the ball gown peeking out anywhere and I can also make it look ratty for the purposes of peasant garb but this is just reiterating my point actually <laughs> of why I hate setting in sleeves because I somehow managed to put the sleeves in backwards completely backwards like this is this is the elbow and it's it's pointing towards the back of the bodice so I have to <laughs> I have to rip those out and uh, and put them back in the other way nice job good job me Alright, so I think I finally have the sleeve set in right. I have the elbow at the back of the arm where it should be. A little puff at the back like it should be. So hopefully that'll be good. 
onto the ruffle and the lining. Here we go. Here I'm just going to measure the length of the waistline to figure out how long I want that ruffle along the bottom to be. I'm just going to cut a strip of fabric that matches that length and then sew it in between the layers so it sticks out once I have the lining attached. And I actually am not going to finish it off really nicely because I want it to look rough. So that's about 40 inches is what we're going to go with. I have this scrap left over from making the bodice that I'm going to use for that ruffle along the bottom. I think just for the sake of sturdiness, I'm going to go ahead and double the fabric. So I'm going to make my strip, eh, let's do six inches wide. So we'll have a ruffle along the bottom, um, or so it'll be three inches wide along the bottom. Um, the fabric is about 44 inches wide. So I'm actually going to cut two of these six inch wide strips to double the length of the strip along the bottom. That way I'll be able to gather it and create a nice little peplum of sorts. So now I have two strips that are six inches wide and, whoop, come on. Wow, you're being really stubborn. Six inches wide and 44 inches long. So I'm going to join those together and then iron them and fold them over and then the raw edge will get attached to the bottom of the bodice. Here I have the right side of the bodice facing right side up and I have the lining of the bodice. I'm going to put the two right sides together. Because I'm not doing a lining for the sleeves, I'm just going to pull the sleeves through. Now this might sound a little bit counterintuitive, but trust me it's going to work because this whole thing is going to get flipped to the inside of the lining. And actually before they do that, I need to make a slit in one of the inside seams so that I can turn it once it's finished. I'm going to pin the edges together. Actually, I'm going to be using my binding clips. 
I really like using these guys for sewing projects, especially when I'm using thinner, more delicate fabric, because it doesn't put holes in the fabric, and also they're quicker and easier to move around if I need to reposition something or repin it, so to speak. So I'm using these instead of pins. And I'm also going to be taking the ruffle that I made and putting it in between the two layers. It ended up a little bit longer than the 40 inches that I need, but that's okay. I'm going to just check to find the middle really quickly, which is about here. And he's going to go there inside of the two layers so that once he's sewn, he'll get flipped right side out and he'll be showing on the outside. So let's go ahead and start putting all these layers together. So as I get down to the end here, once again, I've got that excess. I'm gonna just trim it off. Go back and fix it later. All right, so that's the whole bottom pinned. Now because the lining needs to be attached at all sides, I'm gonna just continue pinning those layers together the whole way around the bodice. And I'm gonna make sure to tuck in the end of my ruffle because I don't want that to get sewn down to that edge. So tuck that back in there and then just keep pinning. So here is where that inside out business is really going to start to make sense. I now have the lining sewn all the way around the edge to the outside of the bodice. We are going to take our hand through that hole I made earlier and just pull it all through. It takes a minute sometimes to flip it the whole way through. Get your hand in there, kind of turn the edges, turn the corners. I'm actually using the ruffle to pull the corners out. For the finer points, I've also seen some people use like a crochet hook or a chopstick or, or something to, to turn the corners. As you can see, there's the armhole in the lining. You can put your arm the whole way through to the sleeve. I think that's pretty well turned. Let's give this a quick press and get it on the mannequin and we'll see how she looks. stomach or pieces that you saw me cutting out earlier. This is made from the same scrap fabric as the tan waistband and I'm just sewing the pieces together and then I will trim it out with some ribbon to give it a finished look. Here on the bodice you can see there's one, two, three. It's enough to really give it a secure hold. Um, these snaps are about one centimeter wide. Let's see if I can get a closer look. There. So they're a good strong size. Um, strong enough to hold the bodice together, but also not enough or not too many points of contact so that when she rips this off 
and the rest of the ball gown drops down. It happens very quickly. It was at this point in the editing process when I realized that the video was going to be way too long to make as one segment. It would probably have been about an hour long. So this wraps up part one of how I made a Cinderella transformation dress and part two is coming to you real soon. Stay tuned. If you like what you see and you want to make sure that you catch the next part of the video where I show you Cinderella's ball gown and how the transformation played out, make sure that you subscribe, like, comment, support these videos if you want to see more.